Hello and welcome to Woman Up, the podcast series from Procreate Project. Woman Up speaks to and about artists, academics, writers and activists, midwives, carers and more. All mothers or parents and all women or non-binary people. Those challenging ideas and ideals, questioning assumptions and provoking social change. The platform is dedicated to the people and women that are taking risks to the ones trying to change current structures founded on biases that have to do with gender, caring responsibilities, race and the integration of the private and the public. We will have conversations about lived experiences, achievements and aspirations. We will also share campaigns and awareness around crucial intersectional struggles and subjects. Hello and welcome to Woman Up, the podcast series by Procreate Project. Um, I'm Susan Merrick, I'm your host for today, and today I'm speaking with Sasha Cancer. Uh, Sasha, please can you introduce yourself? Um, yes, hello. Um, so, uh, I am an uh, external affairs manager at Feminist Workshop. This, uh, this is an organization in the western part of Ukraine, uh, which now helps uh, women from other parts of Ukraine and also from the western parts um just to adapt to, to survive in this uh, uh war new war conditions thank you sasha um am i right in thinking you're also an artist activist yourself um separate from feminist workshop is that right uh yeah um, that's sort of true i um yeah i, I can consider myself an artist so i'm mostly uh in feminist workshop, uh, we try to combine uh, things together, make it very interdisciplinary, combine activism, help, and art, also education. Okay, great. I would like to start by asking you about feminist workshop um, in terms of your role. Um, so I know that the feminist workshop organization began in 2014, so around the time that you had a great amount of political change in the Ukraine and changing to a democratic structure and alongside that the beginnings of the conflict with Russia. Was Feminist Workshop, was that organization a response to these changes or was it something that was needed anyway? Well I think uh, the, the start of Feminist Workshop is uh, somehow linked to the events of 2014 in the sense that uh, the the first people who decided that feminist workshops should become a thing, they uh, supported this idea of the Western direction and uh, the European values, uh, but they felt like the feminist and the uh, female experience or also LGBTQ plus experience, all these uh, things there are not that visible as other messages about uh, financial prosperity, about uh, uh, international law, or Biden international law, all these uh, also very important things. But um, somehow there was still this idea that uh, there are more important, more universal topics and um, like secondary topics which of course feminist workshop doesn't agree to this uh position and we think that um the like feminism is crucial for the future for any democracy and uh, that's how i think the like how, how we got the sparkle right so it was uh, just the will to fix something the will to add something to make it uh, uh, like in a sense of uh, a relationship with other world because of course we have a relationship with our community there's uh, um, different messages here but if we think about feminist workshop as an organization that also communicates with the other uh, feminist organizations or uh, like public organizations in the world I think the message is that 
uh, there are also these voices. There are also many feminists uh, in Ukraine, even if you don't hear about them, there are a lot and they are, um, they, they want to be uh, heard, they want to be public, they have their stories which they can tell and which are of the great value for the rest of the world. I've been looking at what, um, so some of the things that the Feminist Workshop has done over the last, I guess that's uh, eight years now, um, and there's some really amazing things, um, some of the courses that you've run, some of the safe spaces that you've created um, for, as you say, non-binary people as well as women and LGBTQ communities. Um, so there's a real focus on um, women and girls and safety um, and non-binary people and safety. Um, how, how has that work changed this year? Yeah, so the change is very dramatic, but at the same time, we really want it to be um, not so, um, radical. I think we want to have all the things we did before at least present in some way in our nowadays uh, reality because of course now we do more uh, just like basic crucial things, uh, helping women with housing, with food, uh, with childcare. And before we didn't do that, before we um, were more, uh, because like, um, there were other organizations who would do that and we were more like um, about community and uh, creating uh, like educational like schools together or art together exhibitions um, but right now there's so the demand is so high that we of course need to um, like they do the the survival with survival to the surviving mode leaving that uh, regime but at the same time um, I think the like the like our previous work uh, contributed to this we have this amazing network of women we can trust and that's right now before we could trust them uh, with the safe space for our events or uh, like exhibitions and now we can trust them uh, with a safe space for uh, like refugees to stay. Have you noticed, um, have you noticed like a social impact in terms of how women and non-binary and LGBTQ communities are being affected as the uh, you know as, as Russia invaded this year? Has that has there been a dramatic um, increase in discrimination and in, in social things that are affecting these groups of people? Uh, yes, I think uh, there is a, the, it's just this discrimination work in that way that if there anything get worse, uh, the communities who are marginalized, they experience uh, horror to the uh, maximum of it, unfortunately. And there are, um, ways to protect them uh, very often they uh, just need to be separated with their relatives because uh, they are uh, nice people but war uh, like it's, it's obvious but war makes it uh, very huge damage for the mental health and those people affected by it sometimes they don't know how to uh, control this damage and they become um, sort of dangerous for their families and this especially uh, is a case with uh, non-binary people or uh, LGBTQ community um, yeah so uh, I feel like since this escalation of the war started they uh, just uh, um, like they are facing this uh, complicated, heartbreaking decisions uh, uh, when they like feel so fragile to 
live alone to separate from their families, but they actually have to do it because their families also cannot uh, protect them the way they need it. I'd like to know um, what the response is, so was prior to this year. Um, so your organization, how is it, how do people in the Ukraine respond to it? Do you have a positive response? Have you had any challenge, met any challenges? Um, so I'm asking that both in the, you know, the, most of the eight years that you've been running and then as things have escalated during this time of displacement, you know, has there been a difference and, and what's that been like? Yeah, so I think there are changes, definitely. Um, and there are, depends, sometimes there, those are different changes, depends on the region of Ukraine where um, organizations, uh, like feminist organizations or LGBTQ friendly organizations or just even um, just women, the organizations which center female experience, even for them, it's sometimes, um, challenging uh, but the challenges are slightly different in western ukraine or eastern ukraine central ukraine uh, so feminist workshop works in, in the western part and in here there's a um and just uh, sometimes um like lack of support because of the uh, strong conservative movements uh, also it's hard, it, it was really hard to do sex education at school as a NGO or um, just uh, sometimes to have a open um, protest or just being visible. It's generally dangerous for to be an activist and you can be attacked. Uh, yeah, so also when the war started, there were already cases uh, with uh, activists being attacked by some unknown individuals, but uh, they didn't state the purpose. But people have uh, different ideas of what feminism is. Some, and uh, very often they are very wrong uh, in terms of um, like they're seen as something foreign. And some people may see it as a something foreign in the sense that it's from the West. <laughs> Some people see it as something foreign in, in the sense that it's from Russia, uh, which is also very funny because uh, and, like, it makes no sense. Uh, feminism is uh, like ha ha haunted in Russia, right? You cannot be a feminist there uh, openly, easily, uh, but since uh, like the, I don't know, the history, uh, the fact that women got votes early in Russia, so sometimes people think that them comes from Russia. Uh, so those are strange uh, concepts fluctuating and uh, just sometimes some people are affected by them and they attack activists. And that became even more visible uh, since this February. Um, I'd like to know a bit about your own art activism or your own um, passion, I suppose, for art activism. Could you share a little bit about that? Um, I know that you um, have an online space on Instagram where you share um, local art as well. Is that something that's on that's ongoing? Is it something that you've had to pause for a while? Uh, yeah, we, we participated in... Uh various movements and some of our like um, founders they own the, the small uh, pottery shops or like the shops where they sell um, art very um, I think it's uh, sort of uh, out of the academia art if, uh, <laughs> if that's a clear uh, but uh, yeah, it's a really amazing place when I usually feel very uh, cozy to be in in that shop. Uh, also, um, we had the sometimes uh, poetry reading and where I personally I would uh, read my feminist uh, poems there. And I really like that because it's, uh, they're usually very um, private and sincere. 
and this is uh, the only way you can uh, feel um, like may maybe less lonely that your experience is uh, shared by some other woman but at the same time we are in this um, uh, system which um, doesn't really allow you to um, be public about your experience you have to polish it, make it more acceptable. But I think this uh, feminist workshop, what it did for me and for other women, I think, is that you can actually be very bold, very brave uh, and with the topics, with the words. Yeah. But also a feminist workshop did the, on our YouTube, we have the um, like series of lectures about uh, fem like female artists in history. Uh, and there are two series. One is called uh, um, like her art, and another is called her photograph. Photograph. Uh, yeah. Uh, so those are histories, but from her her stories, right? From a, only focused on women um, about uh, visual arts and about uh, then about photograph and this act from them this actually pretty obvious that women did a visible very visible crucial uh, at some point impact to these directions but their their what they were this uh, were silenced yeah and i think that's inspiring because still in ukraine if you an art student uh, you hear a lot of um, like stories about uh, usually those are men artists and uh, as a uh, as a female student, you might feel like um, this place is just not welcome. You're not welcome here. You should do something else, which is of course not true. Yeah. Where did you take those um, lectures? Did you take them to other students, to younger people? Well, yeah, they they are. Uh, except you, you can watch them on YouTube and uh -huh. we have a community online, but also we did like pu public events and we promote them with posters across the city, with Facebook, with uh, other social media. Uh, usually there are yeah, mostly young people, but not just young people are interested in that. And also we have a teenage club and uh, the very recent thing that we do is uh, one of our activists she did the uh, event about uh, Dadaism uh, for teenagers. And I really, I think it's an amazing idea. Uh, she said that for, for her personally, this movement uh, is uh, uh, resonates with her, but also it's the movement which uh, is connected to war, people who uh, came up with the days and they were affected by horrors of the war and for uh, Ukrainians that will make um, more, much more sense now than maybe before and but also teenagers they are also under the influence they cannot make decisions by themselves their parents make decisions I think they feel very sort of trapped and uh, those events they just uh, help uh, them understand that, that their feelings are important and uh, that there's uh, understanding, there's help, there's hope. How, um, with your with your work with other people around the Ukraine at the moment, um, kind of personally and as, as an organisation, how have you find that the displacement caused by people having to leave homes and, and change where they're living, how has that um, how has that affected artists and activists? You know, does it does it create such barriers that people just can't do anything, or is it, is it in kind of pushing forth other work and other activism from that? Yeah, so I think a lot of people will feel that there's just no time, no space for art. They will try to gain more practical sort of, uh, as they say, professions. Uh, and I think they feel sometimes even pressured to do so. Uh, it's really hard to tell if it's uh, 
like what they should do in that position. But uh, generally, I think people feel uh, pressured to um, do something more uh, physical and like traditional because uh, yeah, it's connected with the idea of country being strong and um, important of uh, protecting itself and then recovering. Uh, but of course, that the, there are people who understand that art is uh, the only way. You, actually, you can work with trauma on the like a collective level. So I don't think we can go together as a society to a therapy. Uh, it's too much people, but if we create art, uh, smaller and bigger, that actually allows us to um, work with that uh, experiences, traumatic experiences uh, together as one uh, people, one population. And they will be motivated in that sense, but I don't think they have uh, enough resources. So what I like uh, about uh, Procreate project is that it, it's uh, like it, it gives those women in Ukraine who don't think they can be artists anymore, it actually gives them hope that they can uh, continue it uh, somewhere and just speak about Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely. Yesterday, I listened to a podcast that you did um, back in June last year. Um, I think I think the podcast was called, um, or the the radio show was called "Women and International Conflict," something around those lines. Um, it was was really interesting to listen to. Um, and one of the things that struck me is that you mentioned you've been dealing with fake news and propaganda from Russia for many many years. Um, so for much of your artistic life. So I wondered how you personally filter that and how you've you know, always filtered it and then how does it affect your art as well as your life? Oh yeah, that's a very, that's a good question in a sense, but not easy to answer. Um, so, um, I think for Ukrainians, it's not that hard to filter Russian propaganda because it's, uh, but that's that's just my opinion. I think there are, um, it's directed on Ukrainians, at least before it was, maybe right now it's not, but before I think it was also directed on Ukrainians. So to make some of them uh, supporters of Russia and it worked. But uh, I don't know why, because it's usually it's uh, um, it's not it's not the the most uh, sophisticated uh, tools that they use. They it's more like about um, hate and suspicion and superstition stereotypes. But somehow it works, and probably if it works, that means that it's the uh, like good propaganda in, in, in a way that it works uh, but of course it's evil and just it's for me it would, would be always so hard to listen to it or just meet it somewhere and actually uh, people were surprised with Russia making nuclear threats so often but the propaganda did it much earlier there was this famous quote about Russia having so much uh, nuclear power that they can turn um, their enemies into this quote radioactive dust and the people like try to laugh it out just don't think it's uh, um, like something serious probably they were thinking that who is watching this probably no one is watching this but turns out a lot of people have been watching it um and in terms of art, um, yeah, it, it struck me that uh, like it makes it, um, it makes it, it makes you in a sense more powerful. Uh, 
you should be weak, you should be weakened by the, the horror, but at the same time, uh, you just feel like that's your story and you are the only expert in your experience and that other people just uh, sort of don't have access to it. And that's, that is, if you want to tell it, that you should, you should, you should not be, um, you should not hesitate, right? Um, and if you were writing something or drawing something, I, I feel right that right now the mood is that this is sort of your way to communicate, like your gift uh, that will allow you to um, make the like make these memories, this uh, events uh, accessible at some level to other people. And maybe some people don't have that uh, power, don't have that gift, and they would love to have it, but they uh, they have to find some some other ways to communicate, to deal with it. And I think that's the like the artistic um, side of it. And it also just makes you understand all the war narratives much better. That's another thing that. Uh, maybe before that, if, if it's your first, because in Ukraine, actually, people have experienced some, some of them have this, uh, that the second time they escape from the place with active, uh, um, with active phase of war going on with the rockets from the sky and people with guns. So they do it for the second time. If we talk about people who, for example, they left, uh, like, uh, eastern part, then they left uh, Donetsk, and then, for example, to Kharkiv, and now they had to leave Kharkiv. Um, yeah, so they had that before, but now much more people just uh, understand uh, the stories about war, no matter they're ancient, them from a long time ago, or they are more modern, I think we are, um, like, Mm, this burden is heavy maybe it does make you the most the cheerful person but also it, there's hope that uh, it makes you kinder that's a good hope um, I've seen your name referenced quite a few times in some of the UK papers actually with regard to um, comments on violence against um, women and girls and non-binary people um, that have increased uh, significantly through the war. Um, what as an organization are you able to do to support um, women and young people from from this violence or in terms of uh, afterwards um yeah yeah so the plan is that we want to um take the sex education we were doing on the next level make it more um like suitable you know, for wartime more relevant for the things that happen right now also uh, we can find a psychologist, uh, we can help with that because we have uh, connections, we know other organizations, we, have, we know um, psychologists who can uh, help. Um, so we, we can recommend the, like the, the lawyer if it's necessary. So we don't have lawyers in our organizations, but uh, there are, different feminist lawyers in Ukraine, and we know them. And right now they are also doing the very free uh, consulting about uh, the sexual violence uh, related to war and generally, which is happening. Um, yeah, also the other mission I think is not to, um, not to forget about that, because actually the, the violence happened, the rapes, they were, they've been happening since 2014. 
but uh, I try to look at the reports for from the United Nations or any accessible reports that I found out that uh, like right now Russia does uh, like Russian side Russian soldiers uh, they rape as like in one month they rape as many women as they would rape in a year before before the February. So the scale of war allows them to to make it like I don't know systematic to make it almost a weapon or maybe it is a weapon. We uh, because for feminists anyway, it's actually a weapon. So this question uh, is it is it a weapon of war? It's not really uh, like I don't have hard time saying yes, but. I need to explain that uh, actually any rape, it means that person who does it, um, there's something that um, inside the culture that tells this person that this can be f forgiven, that this can be uh, tolerated. And uh, we know that um, in Ukraine, sometimes women don't know if there's rape inside the marriage that it's rape. They will not even um, talk about that uh, to the police or anyone else because it's different. It's, rape is only something that happens from a, a stranger. Mm. Um, yeah, so there's uh, a lot of things to talk about and to uh, un, uh, yeah, to just make visible and don't forget about them. But uh, I think the feminists in Ukraine, all of those who I know, they agree that it's important to stop the open, uh, like the shootings, the, uh, the, the war. It's, it's important to stop this uh, killing of um, hundreds of people on a daily basis because uh, that's uh, the only way we can we can work. You cannot you cannot talk about uh, about gender about feminism when people just don't have food to eat or food, water to drink. So there are some like basic things which should be uh, guaranteed, um, and for that uh, we like Ukraine needs to to fight to protect its, its population. On that note, Sasha, um, could you tell us the links to use um, for any listeners that might be able to donate anything to your organization in terms of being able to support um, <coughs> or everybody that you support? Okay, yes. Yeah, so if you go on our website, um, there is, it should, uh, it should uh, redirect you automatically. So the website is uh, femwork.org. Uh, and when you go there, it should automatically redirect you to our page about the war. Um, there should be like the, the window, uh, which goes there. Um, and there are, it's in English and in the, in the bottom of the page, there are links to all our uh, like the digital wallets or uh, account that we can receive uh, the donations to and um, but if if it's not redirecting you the whole link is uh, fembork.org slash war in ukraine yeah that's the that's the link which great. should be helpful we'll put that in the show notes as well for the podcast sasha that's great um is there anything else that you would like to to say to any of the listeners or to to share about the work Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the activists of Feminist Workshop, uh, they are uh, doing an amazing job. They are 
uh, I think, in a sense, risking their lives because uh, we think that Lviv is safer than the other regions. And refugees come to Lviv, but there are actually uh, also attacks there from the sky, and it's it just a relatively safe. And those people who uh, work there every day uh, from feminist workshop, I'm really worried about them, and I think they're amazing. And, uh, I'm really ha happy and uh, that uh, I just got to knew them and know them right now and work with them in one team. Thank you, Sasha. It's um, been amazing to talk to you. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, I hope that lots of people listen to this and um, support the organization and the activists and artists that are part of it. And yeah, um, I hope that we can, yeah, find, find some resolution soon for, for you all. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for the opportunity. No problem. This was Susan Merrick uh, speaking to Sasha Cancer on Woman Up. Thank you for listening to Woman Up, the podcast series by Procreate Project. Woman Up is the creation of Amy Dignam and Susan Merrick and produced by Procreate Project. To find more episodes, please visit procreateproject.com or find us on all your usual podcast platforms.